and its significance in the fourth industrial revolution. And, uh, and visitors and guests that will present each very briefly. And uh, we're going to start by going across on Zoom to Professor Roger Sheldon. Do you have Roger on the line? I'm here. Is a distinguished Can professor of biocatalysis. Yes, we I'm can here. hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Well, welcome, Roger. And we, um, Roger is a professor of biocatalysis engineering uh, uh, at WITS. And I think we're going to let him set the scene and give us an overview of biocatalysis and its benefits. Roger, we would like you to spend about six or seven minutes, if possible. Uh, that must be possible, yeah. Well, you can just cut me off after six or seven minutes, yeah. <laughs> so now, how do I get my presentation here? Uh, let me see. Okay. Okay. I see my presentation here now. Um, uh, now, how do I get this? I was afraid this might happen. <coughs> yes, we can see your, your 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 presentation, Professor. Please go ahead. You can see it, but I can't see it. Oh. Well, I, on my screen, on my uh, <coughs> my big screen here, I can see it, uh, but yeah. And uh, let's see. Okay. okay, I'll start and see how we go. Uh, thank you. So anyway, <laughs> I'd like to thank. Uh, well, I'd start, like to start by congratulating CSI on their 75th anniversary and thanking uh, thanking them and in particular Lucy Steinkamp for inviting me to speak at this uh, seventh biennial CISIR conference. And uh, tell you something about the significance of biocatalysis in the fourth industrial revolution. And in particular, uh, what is biocatalysis and what, what are its benefits for industry and the environment? It's my favorite subject, actually. Uh, as you can see, I have affiliations with WITS and with the TU Delft in Now, let me see if I can go to the next slide here. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, <laughs> that is, wait a minute, yeah, it's not working yet. <clears throat> uh, can you go to the second slide? I, I can't go to the second slide here. I don't hear anybody there. Uh, We're I, just was afraid, trying to I was afraid, to I was yes, afraid that this was going to happen. <coughs> yes, Professor, I think on our side, we, I, I don't have access to your slides directly, and it would help yeah. get out from your end. <coughs> yeah, but <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do, but not, I'm not being successful. I, I have them on my screen here, but I can't get them on your screen. So I think what will, if 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 you if you advance your slides, does it do they move forward at all? Uh, because on our side, we, yeah, yeah. On our <laughs> side, uh, we we have your 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 yes, currently your your first slide on. If you advance that, do you see it? Do you see it move? And we will tell yeah. you if it moves on our end. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not.
Hello, Professor Sheldon. I think to yes, right. Issue, um, right. Um, yeah. What uh, we will what? do, what? We, what we will do, is to move on to the next speaker, and then we will try to <laughs> to fix the issue okay. with the slides. Okay. Is that fine with you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's fine with me. Fine yeah. with me yeah. Good. Thank you so much. We 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 have another speaker connecting <laughs> virtually, and uh, uh, this will be Dr. Matthias Yesterhazen, who is a research fellow from Puris Natural Aroma Chemicals. <coughs> uh, Dr. Matthias will give us an industry perspective and an overview of his experience with biocatalysis in industry. Are you there? Are you there, Matthias? I am, and I can hear you. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, we, 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 we're going to let you also present virtually. Are your slides working out there? I can I, for this very reason, I did not prepare any slides because I oh, suspect it might be a problem. So I'm just going um, to be talking uh, uh, normally, um, but there you go. Uh, yes, so uh, as you've mentioned, I uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to present some of our work here and some of our approaches to biocatalysis. Um, yes, um, as you say, I'm a research fellow with a company, Purist Natural Aroma Chemicals. And from an industry's perspective, and specifically um, the flavor and fragrance industry. Biocatalysis affords us a very useful tool with which to manufacture natural compounds. So natural aromatic compounds have a, an increased value compared to synthetic versions of the same <coughs> compound. And, and simply because the, the flavor and fragrance industry has been shifting towards the use of natural um, chemicals for flavoring um, comp uh, formulations and perfume formulations for many years now. So these would normally have to be extracted from essential oils or through distillation methods and so forth. But now with biocatalysis, we are able to, to manufacture these specifically on a large scale using biotechnology. And this is a very handy tool um, simply because we do not, uh, we're not so reliant on, on natural raw materials any longer, plants, etc. Um, and these processes can be run on a large industrial scale. So biocatalytic systems in the flavor and fragrance industry are, it's, are simply um, chemical reactions where the role of the cat catalyst to, to do the conversion is fulfilled by an enzyme or a biocatalytic system. So the European Union and the US um, food stuff regulations allows for the use of enzymes. And as I've said, the compounds that are manufactured in this manner are then classified as natural. So there is obviously a strong um, market pool um, for the use of these compounds. Um, it is a, a, a very useful um, thing to do, to be able to do, of course, um, but it's not all that easy. And there are certain limitations and certain challenges as well for the flavor and fragrance industry to go in this way. So typically up to now, the focus has been, the use of, has been on the manufacturing of high value um, flavor and fragrance com compounds, things like vanillin, uh, which are very limited in, in uh, their natural form, which are very expensive to extract. Um, and But there's a huge market pull for the use of vanillin. There's a huge demand for vanillin, for instance, now. So this is uh, led then to obviously a lot of work towards the uh, um, the manufacture of natural manufacturing of natural vanillin from then biocatalytic roots. It is important, however, to note that the it's not just the the compound itself that is natural at the end of the day, but also the raw materials that have to go into the manufacturing of this compound through a biocatalytic root root also need to be natural in this process. And because these compounds, your starting materials also need to be natural, you often have a situation where the, the raw materials are themselves very expensive. So this becomes a bit of, an hinder, of a hindrance for the, for the process itself. 
But nevertheless, um, there are many examples where the use of natural raw materials can give you a, a significant value addition than um, using a biocatalytic process to get a natural product. What is also very important is that the further downstream processing of the of the compound of the extraction of the compounds um, is also needs to um, comply to all the rules and regulations for food stuff for the food stuff industry. So, um, for instance, the use of certain solvents is not allowed. Um, the use of certain absorbent materials is not allowed. Everything has to be food grade. So there are some there are some limitations as well. But through clever science and uh, a lot of work, and especially um, work that, for instance, we have been doing with the CSIR as well, there are ways and means of getting around this and then get to comply to all the regulations and get to the natural final product. So, um, and as I've mentioned, because now the, the your raw materials can be very expensive um, to start off with, uh, what is crucially important are your conversion rates and your product recovery rates. So there's, there's no use in you being able to manufacture a compound, but only in, in low volumes, um, and then not be able to purify it to the required levels. Um, this is quite a challenge. And in fact, we have found in the industry that this is perhaps the largest challenge to get the, um, the, the biocatalytic process um, running as such isn't uh, um, necessarily the the most difficult part is isolating the product to the required level of purity and isolating all of it to then literally make it um, a, a profitable process which is uh, uh, which can become quite a challenge then so how does one start manufacturing a, a natural compound through biocatalytic roots for the uh, flavor and fragrance industry. Well, ideally, one would like to use commercially available enzymes. Um, commercially available enzymes are easily screened and can be, be uh, purchased in large volumes. And um, yeah, these are good starting points for the manufacturing of uh, large scale manufacturing of natural compounds for the flavor and fragrance industry. Um, it's also low cost relatively. And um, yeah, that, uh, these tend to also be enzymes that have been developed to be robust for their application and uh, long living and have high activities. Um, these, this can be done, uh, well, if, if no commercial enzyme is available to do a particular biocatalytic conversion, um, other, obviously one can go the route of manufacturing the enzyme yourself. Um, this is typically then done through uh, either using a natural organism, which uh, produces the required enzyme and then extracting the enzyme from this. This route, however, is far more uh, cumbersome and costly. Um, and also if specifically if the expression of the enzyme is not, it has not been optimized for the particular organism, it can be a bit of a problem. Um, then also if you have to go the GMO route, which is allowed for the food industry, it is allowed to, to manufacture fluorine compounds by uh, GMO, uh, using GMO make organisms, uh, you, can incur quite a few costs. Um, but if the process works and you can optimize it and you can isolate your product in high yield, it may very well be worth it. I just so, wanted to, so, to, 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 to um, alert you that we, we actually, you know, running slightly behind. I wanted to give you a last opportunity for a few final comments, please, Dr. Matthias. Literally 30 all right, seconds. Well, all right, well. I'm, I'm almost done. So, um, so like I said, there are many applications in the food industry that, um, that are very, um, oh, for the flavor and fragrance industry, where we, we can isolate or 
get to natural compounds from bioathletic roots uh, that are worthwhile and certainly um, worth looking at. We have done quite a lot of this work with injunction, conjunction with the CSIR and successfully as well, and uh, using commercially available enzymes. So, um, and uh, but they, like I've mentioned, some of the issues that we've um, seen, there are uh, certain limitations as well. Specifically, also if you're going towards a, a biocatalytic process that you require some re um, oxidative or reductive equivalents, then this, the process itself becomes far more complex. Um, but that's, uh, I think, that's beyond the scope of this lecture. So, um, yeah, that's about it. <clears throat> the audience joining virtually to ask some questions and we will allow questions also to uh, the presentation by Dr. Matthias, but we'll take those at the very end. I think for now, we are going to quickly move on to Dr. Chris van der Westeisen, who is a colleague of ours here at the CSIR in the chemicals cluster. Chris is a senior researcher who is a chemist and we would like him to have of, of biocatalysis. Biocatalyst, bio Thanks, Sebo. Um, yeah, uh, when I first, I first saw this, I thought, okay, what would the average organic chemist say about biocatalysis? I remember the first time I was introduced to biocatalysis, I thought, you've got to be crazy. All that water, <laughs> and most chemists feel that way, and mainly it's a result of our training. Um, fortunately, that is, tra that is changing over the next, uh, over the last uh, Ten, uh, been changing over the last 10 or 15 years. But be that as it may, why biocatalysis from a chemist's perspective? Basically, they're two different toolboxes. Um, there are a lot of things that chemistry can do that biology can't do. It's not designed to do. And there's a huge amount that, in terms of selectivity and specificity, that biocatalysis can do that chemistry would need 25 steps to do and biology does in a breeze. The flip side of the coin is too though that there are a lot of chemical reactions and we've come across many of them and we've worked on many of them that are in many ways dangerous, hazardous and, and uh, Professor Sheldon will actually uh, I'm sure uh, 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 enlighten us to a far greater degree on this but Many times you talk about the big five, uh, big three, you talk about hydrogenation, oxidation, and of course halogenation. All of them are really, really hazardous and or high energy processes. And, uh, well, under, under a chemical conditions anyway. And more and more biocatalysis is taking the role there to, to alleviate this particular problem. So, yes, it, ha it is very useful, a uh, very unique niche within within the, the the larger the larger chemical industry but yeah it has its problems um, number one of course is water and most of the time it comes down to the the chemist having to learn to use the aqueous environment whether that's using uh, immobilized materials or as as we more often use these days as the whole cell for various reasons particularly for cofactors and such like things mm -hmm. and cycling of an enzyme. Um, and in many cases, that creates all sorts of havoc because, well, you've got an aqueous environment, you've got some weird and wonderful chemical which you're throwing together in, in it and the two just don't like each other. They literally fall out of solution or else they float on top or something equally interesting. So you've got to pull all sorts of tricks of the trade into, into getting these things to work and then afterwards getting them out. And as, as our industry partner has, has mentioned from Purus, um, that's often the big challenge and it often creates a lot of pain, especially when you start adding bits and pieces. <laughs> the chemist curses you from that point onward. <laughs> so. What we've, what we've found uh, in, a, in, a lot, in many cases is it all depends on your perspective. Uh, whether you need a single transformation, a cascade transformation, or a melding of the two, whether you use biocatalysis in one place, 
And sometimes it requires quite a, a, quite a, a great deal of planning, particularly in the routes. What do you need up front? And how far do you go in replacing steps with biocatalytic routes or biocatalytic instances so that you can get the required purity or the required specifications? And this often proves quite challenging, but then again, so does chemistry. So in many cases, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a matter of, of a lot of head scratching, a lot of reading, and sometimes trying things out to make sure that things actually work. Um, in many cases too, and it's an approach that many of the, the industrial people do take, is that they end up with, they end up with um, identifying classes of reactions that they're really good at, classes of transformations. And in the background with partners, usually academic partners, you end up with um, people developing batteries of things that allow specificity and allow them to literally hop from one reaction to the next and tailor make particularly enzymes, not necessarily whole cells, to a particular reaction. But that of course is in the parts of the big boys in the in mainly in the pharma industry at the moment. And most of those particular things are long term. They take their time, but when they are properly done, you do get some exquisite reactivity and radio specificity. That's pretty much what I would say is a chemist perspective. We could groan on forever, but uh, certainly those are the highlights, the lowlights, and the challenges that, that I've identified in the last 10, 15 years. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was, uh, that was quite insightful. <laughs> uh, being a biologist myself, I think it, uh, it's quite valuable. What, what we'll do, I think I'll continue to take comments from Dr. Lucia Steenkamp. Dr. Lucia Steenkamp is uh, also a CSR principal researcher in the chemicals cluster. And Lucia has worked a lot on biocatalysis with a uh, focus on supporting industry to, to solve some of their unmet needs. I think the collaboration with Purus is one example. Lucia, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to invite you to please just uh, maybe give us an insight into what the CSR has been up to in this space. Thank you, Tsepo. Uh, I think one of the first uh, products that we did on biocatalysis was naproxen. So this is basically an anti-inflammatory drug um, known as naproxen or leave that you can buy from the shelf. And we developed a process there to separate the S naproxen from the unwanted R and we patented that, that process and we sell, uh, sold it to Teva in Israel. Then um, one of the other projects that uh, uh, Professor Brady actually did with uh, with us was the development of L-menthol and basically um, with a the chemical process they um, produced a precursor which contains si uh, eight isomers of menthol and uh, enzyme that uh, CSR then developed was able to um, uh, specifically get the L-menthol apart from the other uh, seven isomers. We also did monitin, and again, uh, Professor uh, Brady was also involved there. This is a natural sweetener, and um, we eventually patented this process as well, and we sold it to Cargill. Um, then another one was Allocin. This was in the cosmetics industry. Allocin is a natural skin whitener, and we got the precursor from Alloferox or aloe vera uh, called Alloresin A. We converted that with an enzyme to Allocin, and that process was patented and also licensed to three industry partners. Uh, like we've already said, we've um, developed four uh, flavor, fragr fragrance uh, compounds for Purus and was licensed to Purus, which has to commercialize it. Um, we've worked quite a bit with um, Clive Tubes Africa, developing a number of projects um, in also in the flavor and fragrance um, industry there. I think one of the um, biggest, I think, uh, examples of what biocatalysis uh, can do and how the power of biocatalysis is the one that we did on Ambrafuran. It's also known as Ambrox. Now, this uh, product is um, used in the industry, in the flavors and fragrance industry as a fixative, especially for very expensive perfumes. So they initially got it from Ambra, which is an um, excrement from sperm whale, which uh, basically floats on the sea and it's oxidized and eventually forms this uh, specific fragrance which is used. Um, now the people then started to kill the poor sperm whales to get this excrement before they actually excrete it into the sea. Mm. But luckily they are now protected by all kinds of um, 
treaties, uh, and um, eventually the chemists came up with an uh, eight-step uh, synthesis to actually make um, this amber furan. And um, eventually um, we found an uh, organism that can eliminate seven of the steps, uh, chemical steps, and then we uh, came up with a final uh, benign zeolite step. But basically, we, we uh, create 40 liters of waste, which we can merely um, uh, heat and then discard down the suit. Um, the normal chemistry process for every kilo of product that you make, you uh, create 207 kilograms of waste product. Then there was another example where um, I think uh, Dean also worked on it, uh, but also our new group manager for um, planning and uh, knowledge management, uh, Dr. Um, Dan Fisser, also worked on thymidine, which is used um, as an ARV, and that was uh, patented and sold to ARVR. A lot of patents also coming from epoxide hydrolases. Mm -hmm. uh, this was sold to uh, Oxyrain in the UK with several patents there. We've also worked with um, CPT, we're developing veterinary products using biocatalysis. And then uh, also with Biodex, we, we've used a um, citrus extract and the enzymes in there forms a specific reaction with a chemical stabilizer and that's led to an excellent biocide. This product, these two products are now being registered in the EU. It should be f uh, finalized next week and the client's already producing uh, in ton quantities of these uh, products. So I think that's um, some of the biggest uh, breakthroughs that we had in biocatalysis and CSR. Lucia, thank you so much for that overview. It's quite a formidable track record that you share. And I see that uh, the panel you've assembled also includes some of your friends and colleagues who yeah. worked with you <laughs> in the past. We'll, we'll go to Dean um, uh, shortly, but I think we're going to invite Professor Roger Sheldon to, to join us again virtually. Uh, we, we, Professor Sheldon, we, 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 we can control the slides from our end if it's fine with you. Okay, are you ready to go? Well, I, I can now uh, move the slides from my end as well. Uh, I, I can't see you. I can just hear you. Are you, um, uh, you Because it's me? more convenient that way. I hear you very, very clearly, and I also see you on, on my screen this side. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's... Uh, my, I, Thank as you. I say, I have to, I'll show you. I can, I can move it forward. See, yeah, you see that, or not? Now I, now I don't hear anything. Professor Sheldon, please go ahead. What? Do you do you see what I when I move the forward? Do you see it? Yes. Yes. yes it's working very well from our end. You can move okay. forward. Okay. 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 So, okay. So. Okay. Now I'll start. Then I'm, I've moved to the second slide. It's biotransformations. I just wanted Clearly. to show what biotransformations are. They can be either either growing cells or dead cells. <clears throat> and uh, I would I will be talking mainly about about isolated enzymes, uh, which could be in, uh, in whole dead cells. Uh, the, the use of growing cells in fermentation is also very important, but I'm not going to go, to that, go into that in, in general today. <coughs> I don't have the time. <coughs> so I just want to say something about that. Yeah, why is biocatalysis so important for a green and sustainable world? In the first place, Enzymes are derived from renewable resources and they're biodegradable, which means there is never a problem with raw materials for enzymes. You can make them from any renewable resource. And when you, when you finish the reaction, you don't have to worry about enzymes being in the, in the effluent, in the waste, uh, because they're biodegradable. This is a big advantage over most other types of cat catalysis. Um, they avoid the use of and product contamination by scarce special precious metals. Now, this maybe is, a, is an advantage you don't like to hear so much about in South Africa, being a, a big producer of scarce precious metals. But in the pharmaceutical industry, this is an important point. It also means that enzyme prices tend to be rather stable, whereas scarce metals, scarce metal prices are not always so stable. 
Also mild conditions, which means less energy intensive. They're carried out largely in water, which is an environmentally friendly solvent. You don't really need any special equipment to do it and gives higher selectivities and a higher quality product than most of the methods. So the bottom line is less waste, reduced costs, and environmentally friendly processes. So <clears throat> when I show this, then most people say, okay, Roger, if biocatalysis is so good, why haven't we been using it then for the last 50 years? And the answer is, well, a lot has happened in biocatalysis in molecular biology in the last in the last two decades, which has made biocatalysis feasible for many industrial scale processes. In the first place, <clears throat> next generation genome sequencing and genome synthesis has made uh, enzymes uh, readily, much more readily available than in the past. Second, directed evolution technologies have created better, more robust enzymes. And of course, Francis Arnold received the Nobel Prize for work in this area. And recombinant te DNA technology has made it possible to produce enzymes and do that better and also less expensive. And finally, mobilization technologies allows you to, to, to create better recyclability and stability of enzymes. So what we're seeing here is lower costs, shorter development time. And this is this has really spurred on the revolution in biocatalysis. Now, I just want to show you one example, the ge genomic revolution. Metagenome sequencing plus bioinformatics has revolutionized new enzyme discovery. <clears throat> and you can sequence a gene, well, identify a gene, sequence it, and synthesize it and clone it into a host microorganism within two weeks. This is truly amazing. If you look at this graph here, you can see that the, the cost uh, of sequencing per per genome has decreased from originally $100 million, $100 million for the Human Genome Project to $1,000 per, per genome in 2017. And it's decreasing further. The predictions are that, that uh, you will be able to sequence a gene, uh, annotate a gene and in uh, not much more than $100 in the future. I just want to give one example, which I think really brings it, it home. These people at, at University College London, they, <coughs> they carried out the sequencing of the metagenome of uh, what was accumulating in their shower. <coughs> I think that maybe when the guy or the lady was under the shower, she was thinking about, could I get interesting interesting enzymes out of the drain metagenome. And they identified 29 novel transaminases and selected three with promising performance. And they're functioning at a wide range of temperature and in 50% DMSO. This is just mind boggling, I believe, as shows you what is possible with metagenomics now. And if we think about the applications of enzymes, traditionally, enzymes were applied in detergents, food, and beverages. <clears throat> but now they're being more and more applied in organic synthesis on an industrial scale, for example, pharmaceuticals, but many other examples. And the bio-based economy is spurring this even further uh, to the application of enzymes in in the production of biofuels, in chemicals and polymers. Uh, so from plants to plastics is the, is the key word now. And it just is going on and on. The new, the new applications of enzymes are also on a very large scale. So 
what is happening now in the fourth industrial revolution that we're expanding the scope of biocatalysis from simple hydrolasers to much more uh, <coughs> complicated enzymes, oxidoreductases, lyases, and transferases. And we're now seeing the, the use of enzymes in continuous processing, biocatalysis in flow, and in enzymatic cascade processes where we use multiple enzymes to, to, uh, to <coughs> enable multi-step syntheses. And the in, finally, the integration of protein engineering and enzyme engineering for the future. I think that's all I had to say. So uh, hopefully I've kept reasonably within time. Thank you. You, you kept Thank perfectly you. within time, Professor Sheldon. Thank you so much for that. And uh, our colleague, Professor Dean Brady, is here with us today. And I, I think I'll, I'll move on to Dean to, to give us some insights. Dean is there head of the, the School of Chemistry at WITS and a professor there. Uh, Dean, you had also has worked with the CSIR previously and then uh, and, and Lucia mentioned him. Uh, professor Dean Brady, please, uh, you know, give us some, 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 some further insights. I, I heard Professor Sheldon has already started talking a little bit around, you know, the latest developments and the future of biocatalysis. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be amongst uh, my colleagues again. Uh, we've been working together for uh, the better part of 20 years, most of us. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, Lucia, for taking us through many of the projects and that. Mm. And uh, Dr. Rashamusa, um, your your metagenomics, you didn't, I know you didn't go down the drain for yours, but <laughs> many places very similar, you managed to pull some very exciting enzymes out of there. So that, that's a nice example of that. So yeah, so uh, this has been going on for some time. We, we started off uh, trying to bring the biologists and the chemists together, and uh, that, that follows up from what Chris was saying. We started off very uh, badly in some ways. Uh, we were trying to filter enzymes using chemical filters, and they went straight through. And we had to learn about immobilization and be able to keep the, make the enzymes bigger and more robust. Um, also, a lot of the original uh, reactors were very like uh, kitchen blenders. So. Obviously, when you put something in a blender, it breaks down. We started to look at more exciting ways of, of uh, protecting the enzymes. So enzymes are extraordinarily good catalysts, as pointed out before. They're very, they've got very good selectivity, and that makes them brilliant. Um, uh, Zlatovir is a drug, HIV-treating uh, drug that's just being uh, developed now. And they found that the best method to do it is to use enzymes, in fact, they're using nine enzymes to do it. So when we first started out doing biocatalysis, we would, would try one enzyme, and we think we're very clever to do that. Um, and we <laughs> managed to start adding them into cascades, as, as uh, Professor Sheldon mentioned. And with uh, Islatavir, they've put together nine enzymes in a system. Uh, the nine enzymes all work together, one after the other. They've only, it's, it's only separated into two separate reactions. All of them work in water, uh, which means they don't have to be worked up uh, each time, which is absolutely brilliant, is making huge, huge savings there. They've managed to reduce the process down from 16 separate steps uh, down to three at, at Merck. And they've pushed up the, uh, the yield from only 16% of what they put in is now up to 80%. And the whole point of this is around the enantioselectivity, which is now up to 99.5%. So all of these are massive savings, and that's why they're going into it, is because uh, biocatalysis makes economical sense. It's, it's green, it's environmentally friendly, more so than many other processes, mm. but it also makes a lot of monetary sense. So that's, that's why we're pursuing this and why it has to be done. It also um, has to be linked into this concept of sustainable chemistry. We need to take biomass and start converting it into things, um, and the enzymes are very good at that, and they can then take it on to more and more unusual chemicals as we develop new enzymes to do it, as Professor Shorter mentioned, uh, using uh, things like directed evolution and metagenomics. Some of the challenges we're looking at is to uh, protect the enzymes in a way that we get the most out of them so they last for uh, many long hours. We have in the past, I think it was uh, one of the projects Menthol managed to get an enzyme to last for over a year and recycle it all the time, so it is possible. Um, We've also looked at immobilizing. Uh, Professor Shorten developed a technique of self-immobilization called um, clear technologies, um, which is, has really strengthened them. 
we then also have to work on um, other forms of immobilization where we can attach it or protect it in other ways. Um, and we've also got to work out, as uh, Dr. Matthew said, we've got to work on redox type reactions. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for enzymes, we have to use something called cofactors. And we've got to find out ways of retaining them in the system to make sure that we can recycle them and not waste them, because they're also quite expensive. A lot of this can be done through uh, new techniques. One of them is uh, immobilizing is with magnetic particles. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Dr. Judan, who's uh, associated with mm -hmm. CSR, has been doing some of that work. Uh, Professor Sheldon himself has d developed clear mag magnetic particles in them, which can then be processed at large scale by just putting magnets in and removing them to separate them from the product at the end. And uh, he's also worked at it. It can be done at a scale very similar to the mining industry. So this is no longer s small. You can do this in very large quantities. It can be used for environmental systems. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, we need to look at being able to run things through. Um, if you look at your own body, you've, you've run about 2,000 enzyme-based reactions in at any one time. So we can really take this a lot further. We can develop a lot more things. But you see that in your body, things uh, the most exposure it has is to run through, say, your bloodstream. So we need to probably build reactors which are more similar to that. That goes back to the concept of uh, flow technologies, mm -hmm. uh, where um, in conjunction with the CSIR, WITS, and University of Pretoria, we're starting to look at the combination of biocatalysis with flow systems. We've got micro, uh, microtubules. You can pass enzymes, uh, or retain enzymes there by various immobilization methods and pass liquids through. You can get transfer between water and solvents, which helps solve some of the problems uh, that Chris was talking about earlier. And you can also run things at different temperatures, different stages. So it works a lot more like the body. I think that's probably mm. a much better technology. And I think that's one we'll, we'll be going to in the very near future. So I think mm. we need to really focus on that kind of area. And I think this will give us enormous leap forwards in chemical and sustainable technology in the near future. Dean, I, I'm very sorry to rush you at the tail end there. I'm aware of the work you're doing with uh, uh, Dr. Panaidis, uh, one of our colleagues here. I just wanted to make sure that we do give our government stakeholders an opportunity to, to say the final word as we head towards questions. And Dr. Kunira Sharmusi, who's the Director of uh, Industry and Envi Environments, uh, Industrial Bioeconomy at the Department of Science and Innovation, is here to just say, if you, uh, uh, Dean has been a mentor of ours, uh, but, but uh, and, and here we are now with directors coming from your training, Dean. Uh, Dr. Okay. Pony, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tsepotseko, for affording us an opportunity to share with you from government point of view, how do we see the role of biocatalysis in, from government point of view, we see biocatalysis as a very important technology from two fronts. The, the first front is that we see it as uh, an option to transit into a sustainable future. This is through responding to a number of international and domestic uh, policy instruments. For example, we see biocatalysis being crucial in responding to uh, sustainable development goals of Zerang. For example, the colleague from Puris has indicated that uh, biocatalysis as a technology has a crucial role to play in the food and flavor industry. Secondly, we also see biocatalysis very important in responding to some of our domestic uh, policy instruments. F for example, we have uh, a national development plan, which uh, in terms of phase two and phase three makes it clear that we want to see the role of innovation in driving uh, improvement in productivity and the GDP of the key sector of the economies. And from that point of view, we do see biocatalysis being a very uh, important technology in achieving those targets. The other place that the biocat is very central to the bioeconomy strategy. Scientists tell us that uh, biocat <coughs> has an important role to uh, play as far as uh, reducing waste products to lower carbon f footprint. And with those, some of the positive examples, we do see biocat as very very central to achieving some of the targets that we set as part of the bioeconomy strategy. Also, the government just launched um, the new white paper, which is going to guide our activity in the next 10 years. And there, there are some key policy intents where we see clearly the role of, of biocatalysis. For example, we see biocatalysis being instrumental in responding to the greening of the economy and uh, driving revitalization of the key sector of the economy. 
also the government uh, through the reimagine industrial uh, policy strategy is, de uh, is running a number of master plan uh, processes where we see biocatalysts being uh, very key in responding to, to, to those master plans. Few of them include uh, in chemical master plan, we see it being instrumental in pharmaceutical uh, uh, master plan. We see also being critical in the forestry and sugarcane mm -hmm. uh, master plans. Uh, maybe just to, as part of the parting shots, just to indicate what <laughs> we have been doing as a government in supporting of this technology. For example, five years back, we have uh, supported the, the National Biocatalyst Initiative, which was, was a platform where we are trying to build capabilities, both in terms of technology and human capability around the biocatalysis. And now we are in the process of establishing a new instrument to support this technology in the form of industrial biocatalysis app. So from government of point of view, we see this technology as very, very instrumental in addressing some of our uh, policy imperatives. Thank you. That was brilliant and perfectly in time. Thank you so much, Connie, for helping us uh, recover from the slight technical detail, uh, the slight technical glitches we had at the beginning. I, 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 we, we promised to link all of this to the fourth industrial revolution, and I, I, I wondered if anyone from the panel would like to uh, say a few more comments and a few more words. We had hoped to welcome questions. What we'll do, unfortunately, is to take questions uh, via the contact details that we'll drop in the chat, in the chat um, um, uh, associated with this particular session. But for now, I think I'd like some closing remarks to, to tie all of this uh, to, to, to the four IR. Uh, Lucia? Uh, yeah, Professor Sheldon can also come in if he wants to. But yeah, the f uh, fourth industrial revolution, a lot about big data and um, artificial intelligence and so on. So I think uh, with the uh, progression of synthetic biology and uh, mm -hmm. so on, we've actually uh, come to a point where we can really uh, come up with microorganisms and enzymes that can do a huge amount. But for this, we will need big data to support us. And definitely that will come from the fourth industrial revolution. And um, I think uh, the green economy might not be so much part of the uh, post-industrial revolution, but um, I think the whole manufacturing uh, uh, direction is towards green technologies and you'll also find that there's uh, 12 green principles and I think it was Professor Sheldon's um, and Dean's uh, latest uh, publication on Hitch Hitchhiker's mm -hmm. Guide to Biocatalysis <laughs> that mentioned 10 of the t uh, 12 principles um, are being um, uh, or is basically uh, coming from enzymes so it's definitely a very green technology. Um, yeah, I think that's basically what I would like to say about the fourth industrial revolution and biocatalysis. Professor Sheldon had already mentioned in his presentation a little bit about this. I'd like to hear your comments, Professor Sheldon. Just a, a very quick comment on the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I agree with what, to, <coughs> what Lucia said. Uh, the, uh, what I could add is uh, here in Europe, the, the, uh, the use of biocatalysis uh, for industrial processes and also for waste treatment uh, is it fits perfectly with the with the EU uh, strategy to move towards a circular economy. Biocatalysis fits the role perfectly of uh, generating a, a circular economy. And I'd like to mention one one application of biocatalysis and that is in uh, in the uh, uh, in treating uh, plastic pollution and well in recycling plastics uh, a lot of plastics can be recycled using biocatalysis and in fact maybe we need to go to a, 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 a go to a society where we only use uh, plastics that can be recycled using biocatalysis. And we don't use other plastics unless really there is no alternative. That's Thank all I'd like to add. I'm delighted with those comments. I, I wanted, uh, for Dr. Matthias, I'm, I'm sure it's lonely being away from the session here. We're all here. And I, I wanted some comments from you as we head for closing. Uh, 
particularly around the 4IR element? Yes, um, no, definitely. Um, we've also found that uh, the, the traditional way of manufacturing chemicals for the chemical industry can no longer be followed. It's got no, um, it's, it's, its future is very limited. And biocatalysis really affords us, specifically in the flavor and fragrance industry, a very, very handy tool in which we can access products which are very difficult sometimes to, to manufacture synthetically, to, um, to get them and in high purity and in high yield and also in high enantiomer purity, which is also important for the flavor and fragrance industry. So it's a whole new approach. And, uh, uh, and uh, as some of our other colleagues also have said, in terms of wastage, uh, much, much less. Um, the impact is much less. Um, and if all the challenges can be overcome and the process runs smoothly, it's, it can be very profitable, profitable too. Uh, all that remains for me uh, due to time really is to close the session. I'd like to thank Lucia Stinkamp for uh, organizing this formidable panel. And I'd like to also thank you, uh, our panel, for joining us. Uh, and those that also joined live, it was really delightful to see you. Uh, we will talk some more, obviously, after the session. And thank you for the delegates listening virtually. Thank you. Thank you.